Let's continue our adaptationist program by looking at the comparative method. So when we're doing the comparative method, we compare a population with the trait to other populations, and a repeated pattern implies a non-random cause, right? So in statistics, if you have a bunch of data points, if it's not just a cloud, if there's a pattern to it, then there's something non-random going on. And if other causes are controlled for or understood, then the factor that differs between different groups um, that have different versions of a trait is the likely explanation. And so we can look at populations or we can look at species and do analyses like this. And the good news is that nature has thousands and thousands of different species, right? Here's just a poster of all the different species of whales. So when we go out and look at nature, we have lots of data coming from different species or populations to be able to do studies like this. So let's look at an example. So here's a couple of species that lead to a hypothesis. So chimpanzees are smaller than gorillas, but when you, you look at this part of a chimpanzee, they actually have much larger testes, right? So despite the fact that their body is smaller than a gorilla, their testes are actually much larger than gorillas. So that's one piece of information. Second piece of information that chimpanzees are polygamous, so there's a lot of this sort of stuff going on. When a female goes into estrus, she mates with multiple males, and every male will mate with multiple females each time they go into estrus. That's different from gorillas, which are not quite monogamous, but each female, when she goes into estrus, will mate with generally just one male, right? Because they live in social groups where there's one male with a small number of females. So in chimpanzees, the females mate with multiple males each time they go into estrus and are fertile. In gorillas, each female only mates with a single male each time she goes into estrus. So this leads to the following hypothesis, that sperm competition exists in polygamous species more than in monogamous And this explains the difference in testes size, right? So this guy, when he mates with a female, he only has to provide enough sperm to impregnate her. This guy, when he mates with a female, he has to provide not just sperm to impregnate her, but his sperm is competing with the sperm of all the other males, so the more he puts in, the better chances are that it's one of his that does the fertilization. So there's competition within the female between the different sperm in chimps that does not exist in gorillas, and maybe that explains larger testes so they can make more little sperm cells to win their competition. So that's hypothesis. But right now we just have an anecdote, right? We just have two species. Maybe there's something else going on. So what study type should we do? Well, optimality, it fits the hypothesis, but maybe there's something else that's different between chimps and gorillas. There are a number of other features that differ between chimps and gorillas. We can imagine some sort of experiment, but this sort of thing just makes me want to scream, right? Like, who wants to experiment with that sort of thing? So let's use our third method, a comparative method. So what um, these individuals did in this study is they went and collected data from a large number of polygamous and monogamous species of primates. They measured the testes mass of a bunch of different species and the body mass of a bunch of different species. And you have to do both, right? Because the bigger the body is, the bigger everything is, so the bigger you'd expect the testes to be. So you can't just measure the testes, you have to measure the body and the testes. And then they measured polygamous and monogamous species, and then you can color code them here and they look for a statistically significant difference, and you can see that there is a difference here, right? Basically, whatever the body size is, the testes size of the polygamous species was always larger than the testes size of the monogamous species, and then there's a statistically significant difference between those groups. So this is now more than just maybe a particular anecdote about chimps and gorillas. This is now a general pattern that, in general, polygamous species have larger testes than monogamous species. And now that is much stronger evidence in support of some sort of sperm competition hypothesis. There is a problem that we have to always keep in mind when doing studies like this. Different species are not independent from each other. And when we did statistics, when we do statistics of data, one of the major assumptions or requirements of doing statistics is that all these data points are independent of each other. They're not connected in some way. And that is not true in evolutionary biology, right? Because, for example, these two species here, they may be close relatives, right? That's why their body size is similar. That's why their testes size is similar. That means those two data points are not really independent data points. They kind of are representatives of two, two descendants of an ancestor that may have been right there. So we have to be careful 
when we're doing studies like this, we have to use techniques like something called independent contrasts. Independent contrast, we're not going to do the details of this. Your book has a nice little illustration of this. But we'll just look at the concept. Independent contrast is a technique that takes relatedness into account. And conceptually, it works like this. So if you had data like this, if when you looked at your phylogenetic tree, if you had your polygamous species kind of mixed all throughout the tree and your monogamous species mixed throughout the tree, then you'd say, okay, these two individuals here, one's polygamous, one's monogamous, and the difference between their testes sizes is not just because they're both inheriting the same thing from their ancestor, it's because there's been a change in the mating system and the testes size here that has also like occurred here and also occurred here and also occurred here and also occurred here. So this pattern of data, if the phylogenetic tree looks like this, you have to have multiple incidences of the mating system and the testes size evolving together. For this to just be a coincidence, there would need to be lots of coincidences if this was the phylogeny. On the other hand, if this was the phylogeny, right, if all the polygamous species were related to each other, and all the monogamous species were related to each other, then maybe all of this just goes back down to one case where this ancestor is polygamous and happens to have large testes. This ancestor was monogamous and smaller testes. And then that's inherited by all the descendants, that's inherited by all the descendants. A single coincidental difference down here could create the same pattern here. And obviously then this pattern wouldn't be a real relationship between polygamy and testes size, it would be representative of a single coincidence. But how do we know just from this? If it's many coincidences, and many coincidences starts to become something real, or if it's a single coincidence, well, we have to go and look at the phylogeny. So we have statistical techniques called independent contrasts, which are conceptually testing this versus this, seeing which of these two things is happening, in order to be able to do statistics on data like this without letting relationships mess things up. Here's an example from a study that one of my students um, conducted a little while back. This was to test the hypothesis, does temperature stress explain larger brain size in humans? So modern humans have very large brains. Why is that? We actually evolved our large brains before we started doing really interesting things with them. Maybe humans evolved large brains because of the temperature stress living in Africa there's a proposal that evolving larger brains was a way to prevent heat stroke. But this is just a hypothesis that hasn't really ever been tested. So what the student did was he went and got relative brain size. So that's how big is the brain compared to how big you would expect it to be based on the body size. And plotted that against maximum temperatures for where these organisms live today. So each data point here is a different species of carnivore. Each data point here is a different species of artiodactyl, different rodents, primates, insectivores, bats, and didelphids. Well, you got a negative slope there, so that's not showing that higher temperature lead to larger brains. Got a positive slope here, higher temperature, larger brains, positive slope there. But this data, if we don't take the relatedness of the species into account, this data all on its own is suggestive, but maybe relationships are causing some of the pattern here. So after doing all this, the student then had to learn how to use a program, computer program, to do independent contrasts. And after doing that, it's actually really interesting, none of these other groups have a statistically significant relationship between temperature and brain size, except for primates. So of the different orders looked at, primates had the statistically significant relationship where hotter temperatures, those species tended to have larger brains which then acts as support for a model where human brains are so large now because we evolved in a hot place. So, to return to our testes size experiment, we have pretty good evidence, right? In primates, polygamous testes tend to be larger than monogamous testes. That supports our sperm competition hypothesis. This is actually a figure here, because um, you might be interested in how humans compare to our two closest relatives. This figure here shows uh, the testes size of chimps compared to gorillas, so chimp testes are about four times bigger than gorillas. Humans were a bit more gorilla-like than we are chimp-like in terms of our testes. And that's actually interesting, because it means that we can think about what the ancestral behavior of humans probably was, was to be more monogamous than polygamous. Humans, for most of our evolutionary history, have probably not had much sperm competition, because our testes are a lot more like gorillas. 
if we had had lots of sperm competition, we would expect larger testes, more like chimpanzees, who are actually our closest relatives. You may have wondered what the size of the penis, which is connected to the testes, looks like. And here, uh, so gorillas are last again, poor old gorillas. Uh, smallest testes, smallest penises, chimps. And then, actually, humans excel here, so our testes can't compete with chimps. But the size of a human penis is much, much larger, actually, than it needs to be, right? These guys don't have a problem impregnating females. One of the big unanswered questions in human evolutionary biology is why human penises are far larger than they need to be. So science hasn't answered everything, and so we have this, this interesting question that is just begging for some sort of approach, hopefully not an experimental one. So we have this comparative method. It has its own weaknesses, mainly being that we can't always compare appropriate data. So getting data that is comparative is tricky. So first of all, getting the availability of data is hard. Data from enough species is often difficult to get, right? So each of those testes size measurements and polygamy, monogamy determinations in the species, people had to go and look at the behavior of those species for a long period of time to figure it out. People then had to trap a large number of individuals and weigh their testes to get each of those data points. And that's a lot of work for one person. So this is really a very difficult thing to do just by yourself, which means you're gonna have to get data from different sources and data from different studies may not mix very well, right? So if data and gathering techniques vary or the data is different, right? So maybe one researcher goes out and they measure testes by um, killing the animal, removing the testes and weighing it. So their measurement is in grams. And some other individual, when they go and measure the testes in their species, they dart the animal, have it unconscious and take some calipers and measure the diameter or something, right? So then if you're trying to do a comparative study on testes size, how do you mix together grams and millimeters with your data? So it might actually be difficult for different data points to be compared to each other. So not an easy thing. And then we have these statistical problems, right? So analyzing these data sets requires more sophisticated um, statistics, right? The relatedness caused non-independence of our data points. We maybe have all sorts of problems with the size of the data set, how many individuals were measured, and then at the end of the day, we have to remember that correlation does not prove causation, right? So although we had the relationship between testes size and polygamy monogamy, we don't necessarily have proof that that was the only thing that was different between all those species. Maybe there's something else going on that we didn't measure. That correlation all by itself doesn't prove the causation. It does provide support and it's the sort of evidence that would tend to make us believe this, but it's not proof in the same way that, say, experiments are able to do by isolating factors from every other potential factor. We've looked at these three methods. There is a fourth method, which is to actually do some mathematics and generate some results and then see whether nature is fitting those results. We'll see some examples of that in the third part of the course when we do population genetics, but for now we'll just keep in mind there's a fourth technique but as we go through the rest of this section of the course, we'll talk about some of the studies used to convince us that things are going on the way we'll describe, but we'll start explaining things more in terms of the results and the processes that we have evidence for occurring, and just keep in mind that we're doing all three of these things, and actually all four of these things, in the background as we go through and look at each of our processes that we're going to examine in the remaining videos.